Hi, I'm Dr. Leslie Blankenship Williams, and this supplement is designed to complement a series of lectures on blood physiology. Here, I just present some additional interesting ideas or disorders that are related to defects or deficiencies um, or things that might uh, alter blood chemistry. So this in no way is a complete list. These are just ones that I find uh, particularly related to the lecture topic and therefore interesting. So I'll start with the red blood cells. And the most common disorder that is associated with red blood cells is anemia. The term anemia, by definition, means too little hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin levels are too low. There can be a number of causes for anemia. There's no one cause. There's multiple causes that all lead to the same outcome, which is too little and, uh, hemoglobin. But I'd say that perhaps the most well-known and maybe one of the most common causes is not enough iron in the bloodstream. So this can be a byproduct of not eating enough iron, or it can be a byproduct of poor iron absorption in the small intestine. So as I mentioned, I have celiac disease. Um, one of the, actually the trigger that my gastroenterologist used to determine, or at least suspect that I might have celiac disease after complaining of two years of gastrointestinal problems, was that I was anemic. I'd always been anemic, but I was actually really anemic. And he's like, you know, I think there's something there. Because I was eating a diet that had plenty of iron, but I wasn't absorbing it because my small intestine had been sandpapered down by my immune system. So there was no, very little absorption happening. When there's not enough iron, you can't make as much hemoglobin. When you can't make as much hemoglobin, you don't pack as much hemoglobin into your red blood cells. And as a consequence, your red blood cells are actually smaller. So a hallmark of what is called iron deficiency anemia is smaller than expected red blood cells. Another characteristic is gonna be red blood cell counts on the lower end. They don't have to necessarily be, you know, grotesquely low, but they're usually on the lower end. So this diagram right here kind of shows the difference in hemoglobin, does not show the difference in size, but uh, um, people with iron deficiency anemia have low red blood cell size, small size, um, and then usually on the, the lower end of the, the normal range. Another cause of um, anemia would be where your red blood cells lice, so they pop uh, too often, and therefore you end up with too few red blood cells. One cause is sickle cell anemia. In sickle cell anemia, the hemoglobin is structured just a little bit differently, and the hemoglobin molecules stack up on each other and end up pushing out the red blood cells. So it was circular, and it gets flattened out and pushed out like this. And you can see that here. And what happens when they're in this shape is they tend to aggregate together and form the equivalent, it's not a clot, but it kind of looks like a clot. It's definitely an obstruction. It's a traffic jam of red blood cells. And then the blood coming up behind it builds up pressure and then they lyse. So we end up with abnormally high amounts of red blood cell lysis in sickle cell anemia. So when you take somebody's red blood cell count who has sickle cell anemia, it would be low. So those are some disorders related to red blood cells. I also talked about EPO doping. Now, EPO doping is going to be taking synthetic urethropoietin. Urethropoietin is a natural hormone that triggers hematopoietic stem cells to produce extra red blood cells, typically when you need it. So you're experiencing not enough oxygen transport, your cells respond that they're not getting enough oxygen, and you start a pathway where EPO is secreted. So if you take normal blood, and you centrifuge it down This is in a small capillary tube. This is called a hematocrit. And it shows you the proportion that is supposed to be red blood cells and the proportion that is plasma. So in a female, in a very active female, you might expect a hematocrit that's around 45%, meaning the red blood cells comprise 45%. In a very active, meaning like a a professional um, endurance athlete, it might be closer to 50%. I've seen it 55% before. But if somebody takes additional EPO to increase their red blood cell production, their hematocrit might look more like this, 
which again is going to be really viscous blood. It's going to be very sludgy, um, and it's uh, it's definitely not normal. So this is uh, it tells you that something is wrong. There have been a number of famous cases of EPO doping. Um, you can type in EPO doping and then click news, and you're going to find somewhere someone has been caught doping on EPO. But it's typically found with triathletes, long distance runners, and then um, long distance cyclists. All right, one that I have not yet talked about but is super important is leukemia. Leukemia is defined as cancer of the blood. It happens when one of your hematopoietic stem cells or one of the cells somewhere in the lineage continues to replicate over and over again and produce the byproduct even without stimulation from the body. So remember we had that flow chart with the hematopoietic stem cell and then it broke down into all of these different routes. So it could go the red blood cell route, you know, a neutrophil route, a lymphocyte route, a megakaryocyte route. Typically in leukemia, it keeps going one route towards a, white, a specific white blood cell like a monocyte or a neutrophil. And then what happens is you start making lots and lots and lots of those. One of the byproducts of leukemia is that because you're taking your hematopoietic stem cells and making them a particular white blood cell over and over and over again, you make fewer red blood cells and fewer um, platelets. So symptoms of leukemia that aren't always, you know, people don't always think like, oh, that makes sense, it would be a symptom of leukemia, is going to be fatigue fatigue from anemia, right? Too few red blood cells because you're putting all your efforts to making white blood cells instead of the red blood cells. And um, basically not forming clots, so bruising, excessive bruising. All right, I mentioned hemophiliacs. Hemophiliacs are going to have a defective clotting factor and the clotting factor is part of that cascade. So you can see the cascade here and all of those clotting factors. Of course, I do not expect you to memorize this. But somewhere in the cascade, one is defective usually, and it prevents the domino from getting all the way to the end. So you can see here the row of dominoes in a normal uh, functioning cascade, one where one of the dominoes doesn't work. So here's a domino removed, and you don't get to your end product, which is a clot. Here's another picture that's basically just showing the formation of a clot correctly. That's normal coagulation, and in hemophilia, it doesn't. It takes a lot longer. All right, one, another one I didn't mention is ITP, um, immunothrombocytopenia. So cyto means cell, thrombo means clot, and penia means too little. So what does that mean? Too little clotting cells. So in other words, too few platelets. This is going to be where your platelet counts are reduced. If you don't have enough platelets, you don't make a good clot. And there are conditions out there, and actually a, a fair number of people are afflicted with this, where their immune system starts destroying their own platelets. It can be transient, meaning it can just come and go, or it can be chronic. Regardless, it's serious. If you don't make enough platelets, that's a problem. So if you don't make enough platelets, then you can't make the platelet plug to actually create the clot in the first place. So it's immune destruction of platelets, and you can see the petechiae rash that kind of res results from that. Okay, so that concludes um, our survey of some disorders related to blood.